Derek, uh, to understand evolution, the concept of altruism is mm -hmm. a, in a, a critical one. It's not the psychological altruism that, that maybe we have in our current lives. But what's the development of it? And can your work, for example, in paleontology yeah. have any influence on understanding the, the, um, the importance of altruism in biological evolution? And then to extend that in terms yeah. of the biological um, necessity of altruism and what we would call morality. Yeah. Um, so um, if I if if um, I could take this in Darwin's direction, um, you know, um, f when I think about these questions about altruism or taking um, sort of evolutionary thinking about altruism and extending them, maybe applying them in some way to to our own lives, I like to go back to Darwin. Um, and his discussion of the conscience um, in um, uh, um, the descent of man in connection with his discussion of, of human evolution. And, you know, he thinks of the conscience as um, this, uh, an ability we have to reflect on our own actions and then to approve or disapprove mm -hmm. of, of what we've done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course, um, our, the conscience might often disapprove of more selfish actions, might approve of more um, altruistic actions, helping others and so on. Um, and Darwin has, you know, he, he realizes that explaining how we came to have a conscience um, of that sort is a real challenge because it's not entirely clear up front how right. natural selection would favor that. Right, because <laughs> it would know? seem to defavor yeah. the individual. Right, right, right. right. Um, and my own, my favorite, or yeah, my favorite uh, aspect of Darwin's discussion of this, I think, is that it raises a question that is of more general interest in um, evolutionary biology and paleontology as well. So when you're looking at a at a trait that um, you see some fossilized organism had, you might initially think, oh, what was it for? Like, what was its function? Um, uh, how did, why did natural selection favor that, you know, over something else? Um, but importantly, another possibility is that the trait might not have a function. <laughs> it might not be for anything in particular. Mm -hmm. It might be what um, Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton called a spandrel, mm -hmm. famously, a it kind of came along for the ride, an, ep so, an epiphenomenon. And it's along for the ride. Yeah, yeah. it's like a byproduct. And, um, uh, when you when you read Darwin's discussion of the conscience, he doesn't you know he doesn't have the terminology of spandrels or anything like that. But but it kind of looks like he's saying conscience might be along for the ride. It might be a sort of a byproduct if you have social uh, organisms that have memory and language and, and other cognitive um, abilities. Um, and you put these things together in the right way, you, you might just inevitably end up with organisms that reflect on their own behavior mm. in this way um, with, with the conscience or what he calls the conscience, yeah. Um, and what would the implications yeah. of that for our definitions of morality? Because yeah. mm. I, I, conscience seems like right. it's culturally I, I, instantiated yeah. and developed, right? Yeah. I mean, if right. It's, uh, some, some cultures have a, uh, um, a, a culture where, you know, honor killing yeah. is, 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 is a good thing. Yeah. And if you didn't honor kill for whatever violations they were, you were violating your conscience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, this is, this is something that, you know, Darwin doesn't really say much about. Um, what do you say about uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it helps, it helps to distinguish different projects. Okay. Um, so, so one project uh, might be to use, uh, and this is what I think Darwin is doing, um, and lots of other people have done this too, to, to use the resources of evolutionary theory to, to help explain how um, some uh, creatures like us could end up living our lives, so to speak, in the space of moral reasons where we have moral agency and we take ourselves to be governed by moral norms mm -hmm. and moral rules. Um, and I think, I think something like that is what Darwin's doing. It's, it's a different project to kind of ask whether um, there's any evolutionary story to tell about what the rules might be or what the norm, you know, why, 
why do we um, follow this set of norms versus some other set of norms? And of course, and in fact, as you observe across cultures um, and at different times in history, there's quite a lot of uh, variability about this. Um, yeah. <laughs> A claim, uh, a, a major discussion in the philosophy of, uh, of uh, ethics and morality is whether there is such a thing as absolute morality yeah. or everything is relative. Right. Um, if morality is generated from a biological history and yeah. a, a evolutionary history, right. um, how then could morality be absolute? Yeah. Um, there is. A um, there are some philosophers of biology who um, uh, who make arguments along these lines. These these have come to be known as sort of evolutionary debunking arguments, yeah. um, where um, this is in, in very rough outline. You know, the thought goes like this: like we we might think that there are objective moral values or objective moral facts about you know right and wrong and so on, um, uh, but you know. Um, you know, our, um, our commitment to some sort of moral realism or moral objectivism um, is really uh, 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 maybe something that's like instinctive. Maybe there was some sort of like benefit to believing, oh. <laughs> you know, these things or something like that. And then once we realize that, that should maybe shake our confidence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, because there's a difference between yeah. believing it's Th yeah. There's a moral in moral realism or there's yeah. a, an objective uh, absolute yeah. morality. And there being an absolute, you know, yeah. be, being and yeah. oh. believing in and actual being are two separate things. Right, right. And, and it's almost it almost uh, seems pretty challenging to yeah. distinguish between them. <laughs> um, what, one uh, really interesting philosophical question in play in all of the all of this discussion is whether um, history can actually have um, moral or norm, let's say normative import, mm. you know, can the fact, get sort of fact value issues here, can, the, can the, f the facts, whatever they might be about, you know, how uh, creatures like us came about, um, could those facts be relevant to what, to questions about what we ought to do or how we ought to behave? Yeah, does that go yeah. back to Hume's yeah. is ought distinction uh, and the, uh, in, the inviolable uh, uh, separation between them? Yeah, you certainly run into those issues here. Yeah, um, the genetic fallacy, I, th I think, is a is a possible mistake in reasoning that we make when we um, uh, tell a story about how things came about and then draw a normative conclusion from that. An so, absolute. Yeah, absolute right. yeah, and one example might be if we learned that um, uh, you know humans ancestral humans had a certain kind of diet you know they ate certain kinds of foods mm -hmm. through most of human evolution Paleo diet. So, yeah right. and so that's what we should eat today right. or something yeah, right. you know that right. kind of, um that, that at least at first glance it looks like that kind of argument is not not really so good um and then it takes a lot of work to figure out um you know could there could there be arguments um that kind of have that feel that maybe work a little bit better or or not